I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl. I appreciate you spending some time with us. And I'm very happy to introduce Rick Weiniger. Appreciate Thank you coming you. up all the way from San Pete County. And appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And you've got the most interesting story. I think you'll bring out some things that maybe we really haven't addressed too much in some of our previous interviews. You were actually born Lutheran, is that right? Yes, I was born into a family that was nominally Christian, <laughs> I would call it. Uh, yeah. We went to church each Sunday. Uh, the parents dropped us off and oh, they? <laughs> they would go off to breakfast or whatever it was they were going to do. And uh, But I have to say there was never any Bible reading at home. We, oh. just, we just didn't open our Bibles at home. Um, this went on up until the age of 14 when our parents divorced. Mm. And then shortly after that we ended up moving to Utah. And from that point on, I was pretty much out of touch with the Lord for 42 years. Oh my goodness. Just, mm -hmm. just you were working, I guess. You went to school and uh, working and just... Just living life and uh, believing that, that I was directing my own life <laughs> and not paying attention to things that probably that would have now told looking, me otherwise. <laughs> now looking back, do you think the Lord had his eye on you probably and said, well, I'm just... Yeah. He'll get it figured out here one of these days. <laughs> Looking back, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you eventually uh, get married in life. And, yeah. Uh, uh, at the age of 22, okay. I got married. Yeah. Married a, a beautiful young lady that was four years younger than myself. She was LDS, okay. but not active at the time. Yeah. And uh, we even had a discussion the week before the, the week of the wedding, about three days before the wedding. I sensed and was seeing and hearing a lot of pressure on her about getting me converted. From her family, do you think? From her family. Okay. Yeah, it was them. It was a lot of them that had come from out of town for the wedding. And I would just hear these things, these comments, that she knew what her job was and, and needed to take care of that, and that was getting me converted. Yeah, do you think her family was disappointed that she was marrying a... Oh, I'm sure they were. Uh, I'm Christian sure they were, but I have to say that they loved me like I was their own. Oh, that's great. And neat. it was a, a wonderful, very wonderful relationship. Huh? Yes, very oh, accepting. Good. Yeah. And they probably prayed for you and, oh, yeah. and hoped eventually things would turn around. And, yeah. And... Uh, and after, uh, I guess, uh, your wife, you have a, ch a child together. Yeah, we'd been married three years when our son was born. Yeah, and, and in, that was and a turning point, right? That was the turning point. And that's when uh, my wife received a lot of pressure, from mainly from her mother and grandmothers, uh, that it was, it was time to embrace her faith and raise the children right. Mm -hmm. So she hadn't really been going to church much before then? No, that? she hadn't been going at all. Okay. In fact, I started to say, um, we had my oh, wife... this discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my fiancé at the time, the week of the wedding, yeah. uh, we had a discussion that night, uh, three days before the wedding. Uh, and I just told her, I said, I see you're getting a lot of pressure from your family about me becoming a member, and I don't think I can ever do that. And I said, are you sure you want to marry me? And she said, yeah, I want to marry you. And I says, but what if you want to turn back to your faith? I, I just don't think that that would work for us. 
And she said, no, that will never happen. And so she agreed at that point that that wouldn't happen. Of course, I understand things change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So after your child's born, then, then she becomes more active. And, yeah. yeah. She became fully active at that time. Yeah. And was that okay with you? Uh, pretty much, because as long as it wasn't required of me, yeah. I felt like it was, you know, it was up to her. It was entirely up to her. And our, our children need to be brought up in faith, yeah. you know. And I didn't know what the LDS Church taught. I had no idea. Even though you'd lived here for many Even years, I guess. Here. I didn't know anything about the doctrine. And she wasn't sharing anything or hadn't didn't I don't come think up? she knew a lot about the doctrine. Oh, possibly, mm -hmm. yeah even though she was probably raised in the church yeah. and everything. Yeah. Okay, then Then what happens? Well, <laughs> um, you can imagine that there were times when it was a struggle for us because yeah. the church, as she, got, as she became more active and uh, was in the Young Women Presidency and things like that, I could see how good it was for her. Yeah. And she was blossoming in this, mm. but it was taking a lot of time. Yeah. And it was time away from here again, my self-centeredness was sure, showing. Sure. And so we started to butt heads a little bit on that, but not bad. And you know, as she goes to church, she's hearing lessons about families are forever sure. and temple work and, and all that kind of stuff. So she And she's feeling like a single sister probably in the church, knowing she's not going to make it to the celestial kingdom, or at least yeah. not to the top of the celestial kingdom. At so. the time... I, I didn't even know about those teachings in the LDS yeah. Church. In fact, I didn't know about those teachings until after 2009. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. let's get to 1987. What happens? Well, we had gone down as a family with her family to the Castledale pageant. Oh. And... Uh, Is that similar to the Manti pageant? I, I th different story, but similar. S similar yeah. kind of a production. You go down at sundown and okay. get your places and it happens, you know, in the twilight yeah. and dark. Yeah. And anyway, as we were in this pageant, it was very moving. Uh, and I guess you could probably say there was a burning of the bosom going on <laughs> with me. And I looked around and I saw all of these seemingly, you know, wonderful people sure. that were so happy and so together with their families. And I was from a broken home. And I just thought, I've got to do something different. Wow. And that's, I went back home, we went back home after that pageant, and the next day I asked her to call the missionaries. Oh, I bet she was thrilled. Oh, she was. Yeah. Bouncing off the walls. <laughs> <laughs> so the missionaries come and... The missionaries came for that first meeting, and they started into their first session, and I stopped them. And I just said, we don't need to do this. I'm joining. I just want a date. <laughs> I was determined. I and what did you know about the church even then? Absolutely nothing. Oh. Except except that what I had seen with her family and how happy they were yeah. and you know, just everything seemed good. And uh so when I told them that I just wanted a date to be baptized and to join the church, the two missionaries were very pleased. Oh, they were very sure. happy. That's that's what they're there for is to, to get yeah. people into the church. So did they teach you after the baptism then? You, you go ahead and get baptized, I well, guess. Well, they talked a little more that meeting, but yeah. they did leave with a baptism date. They had given me a date. Wow. And uh, that was the end of our missionary discussions. I, I don't know if they would get in trouble with that, but I know there's some process that they have now, at least. To, yeah. And maybe the bishop living screen. next door to us where he, well, and, we knew each other and well. you were more mature. I mean, you were, it yeah. wasn't like you were a, a young person, I guess. But, but they allowed it. But the bishop lived next door. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, very, very wonderful man. I mean, we talked over the fence for hours, he and I, yeah. both before and after this. Well, did you then start learning a little bit about the church back then? Well, not, not really. I went ahead and got baptized, but I have to say, something was going on inside me uh, the week of again, the week of the, the baptism. baptism. And I just had 150 questions coming out of me all the time, and nobody was giving me any answers. And they were just simple questions like, I don't understand why it's wrong for me to have a cup of coffee before I go to work in the morning. And we were getting close to the baptism date, yeah. and, and I needed answers to these questions, and nobody would give them to me. And one night, we were at a wedding reception for my wife's younger sister. 
and I was sitting with Tammy's grandmother, and she, this lady was a matriarch of matriarchs. She was a stately woman, yeah. Yeah. very well thought of in all circles, yeah. and, and most especially in, in her church. Sure. And I was sitting with her, and I asked her that very question. It was just she and I. And I said, I don't get why it's considered a sin for me to drink a cup of coffee before I go to work in the morning. And she looked me in the eye, Earl, and she said, Rick, I don't either. But every, every time I go in for my temple recommend, I tell the bishop that I'm going to have my coffee, whether he gives me my recommend or not, and he always wow. gives it to me. She said that? Yeah. I, I think he was intimidated. He probably grew up with her as a teacher in the, in the ward there and that. But uh, yeah, she didn't understand it either, but, and she went ahead and had her coffee. And I loved her for that honesty. Yeah, I loved her for her integrity. Isn't it? And, now, uh, was this in San Pete County? As this well? actually took place, no, this took place in Salt Lake County, in Salt Lake, up in okay. Cottonwood Heights area there. That's dark. where Tammy was. That's uh, funny. Yeah. And we were actually living in West Jordan at the time, but her yeah. parents were in Cottonwood Heights and the wedding reception was in Cottonwood Heights. Wow. Yeah. But I cherished that moment because, and, and I never looked at her the same after that because she you was one really, of the... Somebody you could re really respect. Right. Yeah. She had been one of the strongest proponents pushing Tammy to get me converted in mm. the beginning, which was hard for me. Yeah. But when she came out with that honesty and integrity, our, our relationship was sealed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you end up being a member of record for 23 years, yeah. right? So it was in, you mentioned 2009 was also a pivotal time. What happened yeah. then? Well, I probably should back up to oh. right after the baptism. Uh, I went to church that following Sunday okay. and did bear my testimony. And, and I can honestly tell you it was because I thought that's what I was supposed to do the, the Sunday right after being baptized. <laughs> so I got up and What pretty did much you share? Pretty much say? just told them that I didn't really have a testimony, but I knew and you know that I would someday. Okay. And I, but I just felt like I needed to get up there because that's what everybody did. <laughs> yeah, you you were probably confirmed that Sunday yeah, too, were you? And the way Sunday. they used to do that, and yeah. and so you got up and bore your testimony. And <laughs> yeah, and then the next two weeks I attended church, and I just had the most horrible feeling coming over me. Were you learning things or just a, a feeling? No, it, I don't think I was hearing anything that was being said. Yeah. I just had a horrible feeling coming over me. I was very uncomfortable. It, it honestly felt like the walls and ceilings were crushing me. Oh, right. And so I would speak up about it and uh, everybody to your, was... To your wife? Or to, to my people? wife and to really anybody who would listen in the family. Yeah. And they were saying, well, Rick, the Lord must have a great work for you because Satan's fighting really hard oh, to keep Satan's, you out of the it's church. Satan doing that, huh? Yeah, they, they tried to convince me that it was Satan doing that. Well, yeah. Mormons rely so much on feelings. I yes, mean, that's I, this burning in the bosom and the, the feelings thing. Why do you think their feelings are better than what you were feeling? Of course, their answer was it was Satan, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Well, according to their belief system, <laughs> it had to be Satan that was... Yeah that was trying to drive me out. There was, a, I think I mentioned to you, there was a lady, uh, a good neighbor that lived behind us that we were very good friends with. Yeah. And she knew of my struggle in that three week period. And on the third Sunday that I went, um, I didn't know that she was watching me, but evidently she had seen me take the sacrament. I was trying to be dutiful. Yeah. And so I took it and Later that afternoon, she showed up at the house with a homemade rhubarb pie, and she told me that she had baked it for me because she saw me being obedient and taking the sacrament and, oh. and going forward in that way. And uh, boy, when I was considering not going anymore, I had to think about how many pies I was not going to get. You would miss out on those. <laughs> well, because members who or people who become members of the church kind of become. I don't know, it's cliche, but poster people for, True. I mean, it, 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 it enhances the Mormons' mm -hmm. mentality because someone has come into the church and accepted the gospel, and that yeah. makes them feel better and feel good. Yeah. And then for you to get up and bear your testimony, that strengthens them in a, in a certain sort of way because you've accepted. And, yeah. and I'm sure your wife was thrilled, of course, with the baptism, and now she could see the temple marriage down the road. Yes, I'm sure that she was... Visualizing so that. you were expressing eventually, though, to her that this, that you're still having this 
yeah. crushing feeling and other stuff. After the third Sunday, uh, after my baptism, it may have been right before church on the fourth Sunday, yeah. I told her I couldn't go. And she wanted to know why. She was very loving about it. Yeah. I just said, I can't. I just can't. I don't feel right there. And she wasn't real happy with me, but she went ahead and gave me some, you know, some time and some distance. Yeah. And But in those few weeks, I went from being totally committed to become a Mormon, to unite my family and faith, to completely knowing that I, that I wasn't going to be able to exist in that environment. Wow. There was just no way that that was going to happen. Now, looking back, I know the Holy Spirit was protecting me. Just not allowing me to be completely pulled in, yeah. comfortable and pulled in. Wow. Do you attribute some of this maybe to to your Lutheran background? I would all? think so. Yeah. Yeah, because I heard Could the you? truth for a lot of years. Yeah. You know, at least a lot closer to what the truth. Yeah, but you was. do you do make an effort in two thousand nine. If we, if yeah. it's okay to jump up to that now. Yeah. So what happens in two thousand nine? Well, our marriage was great all through those years in the middle. Yeah. Um, she did her thing, being LDS, and and I just kind of watched the home front while she was away. Mm -hmm. And you attended baptisms, I guess. Uh, yeah. Like yeah, kind of back then I did. I I went to baby blessings and yeah. you know with all members of the family, uh, sure. even the outside, yeah. uh, outside of our own. But um, in two thousand nine, uh, I I really believed that if I made the effort to read, and there this is where reading their scriptures comes in. I decided I had never done that. And never really given it a fair mm, shot. Maybe. Never given it a fair shot. Yeah. So I I dove right into the Book of Mormon and felt fine as I read through it and thought, okay, you know, that's yeah. good. Let's move on to the Doctrine and Covenants. And so I read that and was okay with that. And through the Pearl of Great Price, the same thing. And I thought I was done with my plan. <laughs> but this is where God really worked His will, and He put me right into the Bible. And I really need to mention, if we're going to read a book, where do we start? The, the beginning. Yeah. And so I went to the Old Testament and started to read. And over a period of several minutes that first day, I noticed that I couldn't get halfway through a sentence and understand what the first half was. I couldn't remember what it was. And so I thought, okay, I'll read the New Testament. Get to the New mm -hmm. Testament. The, looking back is easy, but the Lord was blinding me to get me to go to where He wanted me yeah. to be. Yeah. And He led me to the New Covenant. And boy, about three weeks halfway through the Gospel of Luke, I, I was convicted, I was on my face. The first time in my life I realized I wasn't this good guy that everybody had told me that I was all my life. I wasn't this good person, I was a sinner. Had you, you'd never really understood that before? Never thought you? about it, never thought about it. Yeah. Had never thought about it. Never seen my need for a Savior. Had you gotten that message at all in Mormonism? No. Those 23 years or? No. One of the things I noticed when I did attend the Mormon church is we didn't, we didn't hear much about Jesus at all, and I did oh. wonder about that. Even when I wasn't, you know, uh, born again in any way or anything like that, I just didn't get that. I've heard so many say that, and yet I was in that for 65 years, and I didn't notice that once. Mm. It didn't even cross my mind that we didn't, that I wasn't, that I was praising men and, and yeah. not Jesus. I, I'm just so blind. I was so blind <laughs> with that. So you noticed that, though. I noticed there was very little discussion about Jesus. Yeah. So what happened in Luke? Just Well, of course, after, <laughs> after reading the first two Gospels and then halfway through Luke, I think just accumulatively the power of the Word of God wow. just hit me like a ton of bricks, and I realized my need for a Savior. Wow. I realized what a wretch I was. Yeah. And, and did you understand grace at this point? No. What he had no. actually done and paid for your sins? and Not until then. Yeah. That's about the time when, when grace started to become clear to me. Yeah. And even, even right then, I didn't understand that as grace. Yeah. That had to come later. But, um, but I was convicted. But here you were trying to prove Mormonism more true to you for the sake of the family, I suppose, and whatever, mm -hmm. give it a fair shot. 
And God leads you to the Bible, to His Word. God is so good. He yeah. had His own way. You had an interesting quote you shared with me. It said, if men teach something contrary to God's Word, go with God's Word. I've learned that that's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I never understood that either. And all that Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price is all the words of men. Yeah, it know? is. And I have been studying Mormonism every morning of of my life since, since 2009. Yeah. Yeah. I continue to do that. I spend a lot of time studying the history of the church along with reading the Word. What's been the and, most surprising kinds of things that you'd share with? Uh, as far so, as? Yeah, just what, what have you learned that, that they should know? Uh, that well, Mormons should know out the there. first thing, the most obvious thing is they believe they know the gospel of Jesus Christ and they don't. They believe they're following Jesus and they're not. And that would be, to me, the most important thing that they need to know. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing to get an LDS person to, to understand. Did, they, did you realize that they thought Jesus was their brother? I, I didn't until I really started studying after 2009. See, I didn't know any of the doctrines yeah. or, or real core teachings of the church that, yeah. that are deeper. I didn't know any of them when I joined. Wow. Had polygamy, had you heard much about polygamy? Had heard some, like yeah. most members today have heard some, yeah. um, but didn't really think about it and didn't really worry about it. It wasn't until I was convicted of my own sin that I really felt the need to understand what the Mormon Church actually teaches. Once your eyes were open, Once my you eyes could were evaluate opened. that. Yeah. Well, you probably know more about Mormonism now than... A lot of members do, right? Would I'm you afraid say? <laughs> that I, I'm, I'm afraid that I know that I do, yeah. just because of the discussions that I've had with friends and neighbors. You can see that they just, yeah. and they don't even really like to talk about. I mean, if you bring yeah. up religion, it's just not a comfortable topic. It's not, yeah. and not not when you can pull out verses like Isaiah 43:10, yeah. where there's only, only one, one God, God. <laughs> and then you can show them in their scripture, you know, where that's. You hate to say what they what they believe, but yeah. they should be believing. I guess if they're going to call themselves LDS, they should be believing the teachings of the LDS yeah. Church. They don't want to accept when you bring up those things, and it causes a rift sometimes. I've got a dear friend next door that has been good enough to sit on the tailgate of the truck with me for over two hours and just and look at scripture and share and stuff. Yeah, and uh, good active member. Oh yeah, priesthood holder. You what bet. does he say? Um, he, he doesn't understand everything, and we can't understand everything now. Someday we will, and <laughs> it's like, well, you know, we have to believe God. We can know what is written yeah. in God's Word. Now, your children and so on, what's, where are they at? And our oldest son, our oldest, is our son. He's very active okay. uh, in the church, and our daughter, oldest daughter, she's very active, her and her family. They're just total believers, committed. What do, what do they think of Dad? They're praying for you? Oh, they think I'm lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have great relationships, though. Well, and, that's good. Uh, the few that times... That doesn't always happen, but I'm no. glad it, it is in your case. And I've had to learn that if we're going to maintain those relationships, I can't speak to them about faith. They shut me down. And, in fact, my son and I had a discussion this last year on the phone um, that led to a three-week period where he wouldn't take a call from me, he wouldn't talk to me. And I... Just upset him. Yeah, he, all I did was read him scri three scriptures. Three <laughs> from, scriptures. From the Bible. From the Bible. Yeah, it hasn't been translated correctly, yeah. of course. So, Isn't that a shock? Did you even know that part of the church doctrine that it, the Bible wasn't trustworthy, that it had no. only been... Yeah. And have you learned that as I have, I guess you have, that the, the Bible is reliable and absolutely, trustworthy. Absolutely, absolutely. That was so shocking to me because I'd been mm -hmm. raised not trusting the Bible at all, and here it is, God's Word to yeah. us. And My most prized possession on this earth is the Bible. Yeah. Uh, I, I, if somebody came to me and says, we're going to take everything you have but one thing, what's it going to be? Well, my house, my cars, everything, you take it all, but... Can I have this Leave book? the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's so different. Well, so do you, f you feel like God's kind of led you along even through these many, many years of not knowing Him. He's yes. known you. I look back sure. now, 
and it's like those the footprints in the sand. Yeah, I can see right. very clearly and vividly his, and his presence you. and his leading and caring and nurturing all the way, which before I never gave any thought to at all. Yeah, not at all. Well, we've our time's gone quickly again. Wow. What would you say to your family, friends, and people that I are think listening the, to you? I think the most important thing that we can ever do is try to get God's Word in front of them. Try to get them to read the Bible as a child. You know, yeah. we say that a lot, but it's, it's the truth. If we're willing to shed our pride, put aside our preconceptions, and even our beliefs, yeah. just set them aside and go see what God has to say and let Him speak to us and believe Him, then it's easy. That's what happened to me. Yeah, just got you to start reading the New Testament. And yeah. Yeah, it's just amazing, and and to understand the the gospel of grace, the gospel of grace, what, it's all grace. and what he did on the cross. You know, it's it's just so funny how many things there is in Mormonism that are twisted away from what Jesus did. Uh, even the atonement in the Garden mm -hmm. of Gethsemane. You know how yeah. they revere that, and they say that's where Jesus took upon himself the sins. But Hebrews and other places in the Bible are very clear that. Yeah. It was the shed blood and yeah. what the high priest used to do in the temple. What temples are for? There's another twist of the truth. Do we have a second? I can sure. Pull yeah. something out Real here. Quick. Speaking of that temple, um, this is one of the things that I was reading just the other day. But I'm, I want to back up and, and I want to talk about the apostles here in God's Word. And I just want to read in Revelation 21, excuse me, chapter 14, to any LDS. Chapter 21, verse 14. Verse 14, okay. yes, excuse me. For any LDS uh, that believe truly in their apostles, and, and most do, <laughs> John is describing New Jerusalem descending, and the wall of the city, 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12, were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There's <laughs> only 12. There's 12 stones, yeah. there's 12 names. Those were, and it's not all this the apostles that, right? And then about the temple, John saying, "I saw no temple in it." This is the New Jerusalem, the city. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Yeah, and God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He does not. Rick, thank mm. you so much. What a wonderful story, and I I think you've probably shared some things here that hopefully will make people think. I hope so. I appreciate you coming up and spending your time doing that, time and money. Well, thank appreciate you. that. And thanks for watching. You are following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. See you next week.